In the spring of 1940, Britain faced a military disaster. Trapped on the beaches of Dunkirk, the British Expeditionary Force faced an impossible situation as Hitler's army closed in. We went through hell. The guts, the bleeding, the men being blown to pieces and the machine gunners shooting down by the hundreds. It was absolutely dreadful. These stukas were fitted with sirens and they screamed as they came down to frighten you, and they did. We were dive-bombed all day long, dead bodies. You just prayed you were in the right queue. One of my friends got hit in the head by a shrapnel. Both of his eyes were blown clean out of his head. He died almost instantly, which was a good thing. They came diving down on us. The soldiers said, what the devil are you doing here, missus? They piggybacked me along the beach. It looked as though, potentially, for Britain, the war was over before it had even begun. The core of the British army was on the brink of being eliminated. There seemed no escape. We were on the beach for 48 hours. No food, no water, nowhere to go, nowhere to hide. We just hoped it. Operation Dynamo was the climactic moment of one of the greatest escapes of all time. Hundreds of British ship crews, many in private boats, crossed the channel, bravely plunging into the thick of battle. The water was up to my chest, overcame the Luftwaffe, so we were like sitting ducks in the water. My overcoat was permanently wet from the waist down. I could hardly swim, but it's surprising when you've got to, you, you do it. This hospital ship got blown. This bomb went right down the funnel, and it blew the smithereens, and those dead and dying boys all lay in the water. And the captain said, we cannot stop, gentlemen, we cannot stop. And then suddenly, we got into the channel, and there was relief, relief, relief. We got to Dover, and then we kissed the ground and cried our eyes out. <laughs> In celebration of the courage of the soldiers and those who saved them, this is the story of an epic escape that must never be forgotten, told by those who were actually there. I have been to hell. I was thinking, dream of it every night, every day, of the days when I went through so much to live. And now 99.4 is clear. <laughs> every morning, to wake up, and there it is. And I'm amazed I'm still alive. I can dream every night about it. I'm the only known living survivor of my battalion. I mean, I was only one of million, wasn't I? They're so forgetful today. I talked to some people, they said, what war was that? You know, that's the attitude of today. I mean, I go to schools, the kids have never heard of Dunkirk, nor of the teachers. Dunkirk is so important in a global, military, political sense that it's amazing to me that it, you know, people don't remember it. Certainly until the film came along, people had no idea at all what Dunkirk was. And even those who knew thought about it as, you know, that little British bit that happened before America got involved and saved the day. It's a hell of a lot more important than that. It's a universal story of survival. It was a miracle in the sense that so many troops got home when, you know, on the face of it, it didn't seem likely that very many would at all. The fact that the British got home 
meant that Britain didn't have to make a peace treaty with Hitler. Britain didn't have to surrender. If the troops had been destroyed, the war would have been over, and the consequences, well, would still be with us today. There is no glory in war. It is just survival. I was born in 1918. A pretty poor family. My mother wasn't a lovely lady and they couldn't control me, so they said, uh, you will go to Doc Badada's home. So I went when I was five till I was eight, and then from there I went to Norwood Children's Homes for two years, and I went to Sudcup Homes, and that was my early years. And uh, believe you me, you can't understand life in those days. It was pretty, pretty rough, pretty rough. I joined the Terrorist Hall Army and at the age of 18. Well, I joined it because the cheap beer in the canteen and the girls liked men in uniform. I didn't really join it to become a soldier. We joined the Terrorist Hall Army at Brixton. I was in front of the infantry. My job as an anti-tank gunner was to shoot the tanks. We were cycling along with my friend in Wimbledon Common recruiting sergeant stopped us and said, would you like to join the army? We said, yes. He said, uh, how old are you? And I told him, 16. Oh, he says, you're not old enough. I said, hang on a minute. No, I'm 17. So he signed me on. My life was nothing. So that's why I joined that movie. I was not quite 17. Kid that age, it was marvellous, the uniform. We tried again and again to prevent this war, but now we are at war, and we are going to make war, and persevere in making war until the other side have had enough of it. I was born in Belgium, Antwerp, then the war came because we had to get out. The Germans smashed our house to bits and of course we had to leave everything behind. I was only nine. The war was declared September the 3rd, 1939. And the end of September, I was called up. So I was in pretty quick. I was conscripted. I saw the war was coming and my father advised me to get out of the army and join the Air Force. We had a medical for air crew. I was wearing glasses. I failed the medical and saved my life because the majority of my class didn't live out the war. So having glasses saved my life. We looked upon it as an adventure at first. We never realized, you know, what it was going to be. I was 19. We didn't know what it was going to be, you see. Well, nobody could really, really know like what would happen. World War II was the most savage and destructive global conflict in history. In the wake of the German invasion of Poland, in September 1939, the British Expeditionary Force were dispatched to Europe. At the very beginning of the war, 1939, you had the British Expeditionary Force travelling out to France. These were young men who'd never been abroad before, so it was an incredible experience for these people. They were going out on the boats across and in trains travelling across France, just, you know, clamouring to get to the windows to see what a foreign country was like. Not much was happening, and they ended up meeting French people, eating French food, doing all sorts of things that they'd never done before, and being away from home. It was kind of an adventure for these young people. Britain is slow to anger and certainly never wanted this war. 
But since it's been forced upon her, she's fully determined to see it through, no matter what sacrifices are demanded. And those who are making the biggest sacrifice, the fighting men, are the most cheerful. We went to Chateau de Brias. It's a big chateau, very nice. We sailed across on Christmas Day, landed in Cherbourg in France on Boxing Day. So that was our Christmas. <laughs> we went to a place called Gondicor, up near the Belgian border, and I was in a machine gun battalion. A lot different from being at home with your mum, you know. <laughs> As I was able to drive, I was put into the Royal Army Service Corps, which is all transport. That winter of 1939 was a very severe winter. Deep snow. We were so short of supplies, and that was the trouble. We were sleeping in haylofts, and you were given one blanket between two, and it was freezing. In fact, my pal and I got up one night and we've had a job in the snow. We run as much as we could to try and get warm we were that frozen. Soldiers were issued with food rations designed to meet their nutritional requirements. You're given a tin of bully beef, like a corned beef, a packet of biscuits, like dog biscuits, and that was your meals for the day. These army biscuits, you couldn't buy them. You had to break them with something and make them soft and swat them. So I said, yes, I'll have another one. And I nearly broke my teeth biting it. They were so hard. They say the biscuits got a lot of energy in it, so I'll take their word for that. <laughs> Sometimes the cook gave us what he called stew, but best not to ask what was in it. <laughs> The BEF that went to Europe in 1939 was a totally mechanized army, but with scandalously inadequate training, they were ill-equipped to fight a superior German army. A lot of the troops weren't trained because they weren't really soldiers. Virtually all of them, it was the first time they'd seen action. It's an amazing fact, a lot of these people had never fired a gun, literally never fired a gun. By the time we went to France, we just about knew which end of the machine gun the bullet came out of. It was all we did was much about. You'd given a bit of basic drill, given a rifle, a little bit of target practice, and then I was allocated a lorry, and that lorry you kept all the time. What we used to do was learn each other's job on an MTV. I could fire a gun, strip it down, put it back. I could cox a boat. I don't know everything about Bob. Well, Jack seems to be having a pretty exciting time at sea. There's no doubt he's doing his bit all right. Here we are at home, nice and comfortable, sitting round the fireside. Do you know, it makes me feel I'm not pulling my weight in this room. By May 1940, things looked bleak in Europe, as Hitler's army unleashed devastating attacks on France, Belgium, and the Netherlands. In May, the action really began. The Germans moved forward, and so did the British Expeditionary Force move forward to meet them at a prearranged point in Belgium. But they hadn't been allowed into Belgium up to this point. The idea was Belgium was staying neutral and would only get involved if it was attacked. So once the Germans moved into Belgium, so the British Expeditionary Force and the French moved forward from their lines in France forward into Belgium to meet them. The first place we went to was Brussels and the street we were in was empty. It had been completely evacuated. The civilians had just gone. We got on the train in Antwerp and it wouldn't move. So we got off and we walked from Belgium to France. We walked all that way. It was a beautiful day, lovely sunny sky, little white clouds, and we was in this French village. And I was walking across the square, and out of a white cloud came a German fighter, swooped down a machine gun at me. But he was a rotten shot, he missed me. 
when Germany started the Blitzkrieg, the 10th of May, that's when we first met up with the Germans. Went all the way along the River Dial, and the Germans were on the other side, firing at our guns, and we were firing at their guns. So we had a Lysander up there, sending the information to me, and I informed the army. So eventually got the target and shot their aircraft down. What was expected really was a standoff, like the First World War. A war of attrition, a war of very little movement. People thought they would be ending up in their own trenches, facing the Germany in, in their trenches, because that's what they were used to. But that's not what happened, because the Germans mounted this incredibly audacious attack through the Ardennes, using their panzer tanks, and it just cut through the defences. People didn't think they could get through a forest with their enemy attack, but the fact was they did. And there were virtually no defences behind it, so they went straight through. And in a matter of days, they had reached the coast. We found ourselves at a town called Wyvern. These stukas would circle up and then pick their target, and the leading one was to be diving down. Well, we discovered that if you fired, those who were circling could see the flash of the guns, and they would probably bomb you. So in the end, we used to wait until the last one was in his dive, he used to come almost vertically, and he couldn't alter it, and that's the one we used to shoot at. Shot one down, anyway, that was quite satisfactory. I heard that the Germans are four miles away, and I suddenly saw a roadblock, soldiers coming through, it was the guards' brigade. I said, what are you buggers doing? He said, we've been told to retire to Lille. I said, well, I'm, I've just left there. And he said, well, you better hang about, see what's going on. So my officer, he went and found out that we've got the move too. So from there, we went to Arras, Amiens, and fought the Germans down there. The Allied armies were hampered by poor communications. With no common leader, they often operated solely with their own objectives in mind. We didn't know where we were going and what we were doing. The lack of communication between the British and the French in the build-up to Dunkirk, neither side really knew what the other was doing. Sergeant Grover said, Harry, you put on that spot there with your gun, and if any tanks come into you, with their guns pointing forward, they're enemy. If the guns are reversed, they are friendly. So I said, OK, Sarge. So I sat there with my gun, and I said, there's tanks coming, Sarge. He said, well, shoot the bastards then. I said, yeah, well, I can't see him. Oh, right, get on. So we carried on, and something, they started firing at us. Guns were blowing us to pieces. I thought, this is terrible, this is terrible. And then suddenly my gun was hit, and we were knocked out for a couple of minutes. And suddenly, Monsieur, oh, Monsieur Bichard, we're so sorry we thought you were the Germans. These are suddenly Frenchmen in this tank as big as a house. But we got about 17 casualties then. The lesson that was learned was that communication with their allies would have to be far, far better in the future. And not only that, their communication amongst themselves would have to be better. The Allied defenders were unable to match the sheer might and ferocity of the German Blitzkrieg attack. Faced with superior air power and a more unified command, they were a poor match for the German Wehrmacht. The German army was better equipped, it was most certainly better trained and more experienced. All their armaments were better than ours. Their machine guns were better, their anti-tank guns were better, their tanks were better. We were one step ahead of what we got. They always had bigger tanks that could fire far distances. They just stood out of range of ours and just knocked them out. We had rifles but they weren't good. My weapon was a Webley 38. When it was time to fire them, it was time to get out of it, because you couldn't hit a barn door at 10 feet with them. The defenses of Paris are airtight. Enemy planes will find a barrier of steel guarding the throbbing heart of France. The bitter lesson of 1914 has resulted in the famous Maginot Line. 
where mile after mile along France's eastern and northeastern frontier are lines of steel and concrete gun turrets connected underground by vast subterranean chambers. Here, entire armies can be quartered in comfortable and air-conditioned surroundings. They shall not pass is the historic war cry of the French soldier, and the scissor-like crossfire of the Maginot Line makes doubly sure that the new world war will not be fought in France. The Allies could do little to stem the advance of the enemy. In the town of Wormhout, 17 miles from Dunkirk, British troops were overrun by advancing German forces. I saw the best and the worst of war. I had some wonderful friends and my colleagues were so brave. There was a hundred soldiers put in a barn as prisoners. So the Nazis came through one evening and they machine gunned and shot every soldier in there. And these men were murdered. But fortunately, Pooley and Callahan were still alive under their bodies with their mates. And they stayed there with all their dead and dying. And those dear ladies, farmers' wives, put them in the grave. I tell you one thing, not all Germans were bad, although we were trying to kill each other. And I don't suppose a lot of them wanted to be where they were any more than we did. The funny thing is that I like the German people. They're a lovely lot of people. It was just these Nazi troops. I saw plenty of Germans do, you might say, acts of mercy to wounded soldiers. They would always attend to them according to severity of their wounds, regardless of what uniform, whether it was grey or whether it was coral key, and we used to do the same. You know, the ordinary German person, that's a bit of a fight. I always used to say to my men, if you take any prisoners, treat them as you would wish to be treated if the situation was reversed. I mean, after all, they were human beings. As Hitler's forces moved through France at lightning speed, the Allies found themselves fighting against overwhelming odds. You had to be disciplined. I didn't see any cowards. Well, I only had one, he was a driver. I'm not going to tell you what his name was, but he was a proper ladies' man, curly hair with a little moustache, and his side cap on the side of his hat and he was a boaster. We couldn't find this fella. He went missing and I found him lying in a slit trench. So I said, like, where have you been? He said, I got lost. And I said, well, how do you get lost? Walking up in broad daylight behind someone else. But anyway, that was it. So we used to give him the least responsible job, which I thought wasn't quite fair. You know, the least dangerous job. I know you had a wife and daughter. I said, what will your family think when you're branded a coward? He said to me, I don't care what you say or do to me, he said, I'm not driving this carrier up that road. Well, the only thing you could do was to stop their pay. Not that we got much anyway. And I wouldn't have mind if he wasn't such a boaster. When he was out, oh, we did this, we did that, I said, you did nothing. You sick crap, your pants. I don't know whether you call that trauma or what. It would be several years after the events at Dunkirk that military psychiatry became an essential element of medical provision. Those soldiers that come back from the front, I know exactly how they feel. I used to have a lot of flashbacks, but I never, I never had any treatment or anything. I never bothered about counselling. You had to get on with it. I didn't need counselling. May I say, the men of those days were a lot different than the men today. Counselling, caught kick up the backside. Bloody counselling, a load of rubbish. 
There wasn't anyone to give them counselling. Well, not officially. Outnumbered, outgunned, and outmaneuvered, the Allied defenders fought a desperate retreat as the Nazi war machine closed in. The blitzkrieg operations of the Germans had effectively encircled the British army in northern France. The speed meant that they almost got to the point of cutting off any exit. The effect of these tanks streaking through and reaching the coast meant that the British expedition force was effectively outflanked. It meant that even before the fighting had begun in any real sense, they already were on the back foot and they were going to have to retreat. The British, from a purely pragmatic view, saw that the battle was lost. They knew it was going to end badly and they thought the only way we can stay in the war is to get our men away and then we can carry on the fight. We knew things were boiling up and Germans came in in one end and we went out the other. And the Germans circled us around. It happened so quickly. The only way out was by water. And by that time, the word was Dunkirk. That was the only escape for the British soldier. Along this road came this German star car. The troll shot the driver, and the officer in the back jumped out and ran away. But he left behind in the car his helmet, his belt with his Luger, and a briefcase. That was immediately taken to the divisional headquarters, and they realised this briefcase contained the plans for the German Corps that was to attack Dunkirk. There were two days' grace which allowed the French citizens to get out of Dunkirk itself, because it had been bombed heavily, and the French soldiers to barricade it so that they could defend it. The situation was rapidly becoming desperate. German tanks had reached the Channel coast. The Maginot Line had been outflanked. With the French and Belgian armies retreating on each side, there was only one option for the BEF, withdrawal to Dunkirk. I was driving along this very twisty road, and there was a bridge that had been hit, and the road was completely blocked. You couldn't get through. So I stopped, and while I was looking at the map, I suddenly saw someone coming up with a revolver in his hand. So I grabbed my rifle ready to shoot and then realised it was a British officer. He said, where are you making for? And I said, that little village. He said, well, good job for you that the bridge is down because the Germans are in charge of that village. And he said, in case you don't know, you're encircled, so make for the beach. So I drove back to where my company was, but they'd gone. <laughs> Montgomery was able to shift my division to fill up the gap where the German panzers were going to come through. So we got to the Comines Canal, where we took up position just in time before the Germans arrived the other side. We were there for about five days holding them back while the rest were getting away from Dunkirk. On the last night, the Germans got around us, so it was decided someone had to go back to our headquarters and tell them what was happening. So I volunteered. So I ran up to this farm, and on guard outside was a friend of mine, and uh, he shot me well, from a few feet, but, but it, wasn't serious, it went through my shoulder, right shoulder. He thought I was a German. And he said, I'm sorry. He said, I, I, I aim for your head. Well, he was only a few feet from me. And I said, it's a bloody good job you are a rotten shot then, isn't it, John? Defeated and humiliated, the Allies were backed into a corner. Surrender seemed inevitable. The war for Europe was assumed to be won. This 
incredible defeat, because that's what it was. It was a huge defeat. Uh, looked as though it would wipe out the British army. If the army was outflanked already, all the Germans had to do was to curve round and, and it would be completely surrounded. And if it was completely surrounded, how on earth could it possibly do anything but surrender? We heard from the general that they could not help us. I knew we'd lost the war. And you thought, well, they're going to invade Britain now, and that's it. I didn't know how we could uh, possibly win at that stage. We'd lost everything, the whole British army, all its equipment. Amid the unfolding chaos, the BEF headed for Dunkirk. As the British army moved back, it became fairly clear to Lord Gort, he was the commander-in-chief of, uh, of the British Army, that if Britain was going to survive in the war, there would have to be some kind of evacuation. And it became very clear that evacuation could only take place through Dunkirk, because bit by bit, all the other ports came into German hands. The only one that was still in Allied hands was Dunkirk. Now, the British soldiers, they didn't know why they were retreating. We didn't know what was happening. It was dark. We just walked and walked and walked to, to Bray Dunes. Eventually we decided to walk to where that smoke was coming from, Dunkirk. They were sent into the retreat, thinking maybe my unit's done something wrong and we're being punished and we're being sent back. They didn't realise for a long time that they had been completely outflanked themselves. And so back they came. We got through and I said, oh, come on, Ken, jump up. I got a lovely big horse, but I put him on board, I said, we're going to have a ride in Dunkirk on this. We started the ride, I said, no, we can't do that, that whole horse is going to get killed. Come on, off you get, let's go back. And then we walked, walked, and that was it. We handed over to French troops to hold the Germans back while we got away, so we drove to the outskirts of Le Pan and we were told there was someone there that would meet us and tell us where to go. Because we got there, was no one there. So we walked into the sea. I remember the water was about up to my chest. Overcame the Luftwaffe, machine gunning along the beach. There were no ships, no boats at all there. So they took us out the water decided that each machine gun crew would find their own way. We came across a farm and the farmer came out and said, are you staying? And we said, well, we're moving slowly. And he said, well, here's the key of my house. He said, look after it as long as you can because I'm going and leaving everything behind. And then the signal came through, evacuate. So we evacuated, and that was the end of that. We were three weeks on the road. We were in the farmyard with all the animals. All we could help ourselves went into the nest boxes, but we couldn't drink the water. We couldn't drink nothing. We could have nothing to drink. I hadn't got any food, no water, nothing. And I said, oh, Ebby, I said, what are we going to do? He said, Harry, there's, a, there's an old bullock there. He said, we're going to shoot him up. He said, he's going, ooh, I can, I, can, I, can hear him, I can hear him moaning, poor old thing. So we shot him, and he cut some joints of beef off him. And we had steak and thick. My God. We did eventually meet the soldiers. We were with the Cheshire Regiment. They were very good. They fed us. We had a lot of biscuits, hard crust things, horrible. <laughs> With the enemy on their heels, the retreating army continued to the coast. We were told that if you find a forces shop, just go in and help yourself because the Germans will have everything. So I went in there and I got some cigarettes and my co-driver, who had never driven the lorry, he got some whiskey, he was a Scotsman. He was in the back of the lorry, drunk. And that was the last I saw of him until I got to the beach.
many refugees on the road and they just wanted to get out of the way. So this really hampered uh, the British retreat because they were retreating uh, alongside hundreds of thousands, millions of civilians who were also trying to get away. So it's chaos. You know, the roads are chaos. The whole atmosphere is one of chaos. What is going to happen? Nobody knew. We had to keep going, but um, the French did suffer. Oh, we saw some terrible things there. Terrible. The dead bodies on the side. It was terrible. The terrible sights we used to see of hundreds of people being murdered and bombed and blown up. All these uh, refugees with prams and horses and carts and of course the Luftwaffe, they were machine gunning to cause chaos and block the roads. I just bomb anything. They didn't care. We went through so much death, rotten bodies, men, soldiers, horses, cattle, everything. It was absolutely dreadful. We saw an officer laid out. He was, he was dead, lying on the Oh, I said to him, and all his little photographs were, were hanging out of his children and everything. Despite the horrors, the soldiers had no choice but to keep moving. People try and help me, help me. It was a, a fiasco, absolutely a fiasco. When I saw those poor dads being blown to pieces, and you just ignore it, you just ignore it. You know, it's happened, and it's gone. It's really terrible to see these women and children being injured and that, but there's not much we could do about it, like, you know. We couldn't save anybody when you're going through on, on an action. It's despair and you did your best, but you know you had a job to do. There was a little boy who came home from school and he found his house had been bombed and his mother and father were killed. And he said, where's my mummy? Then he followed the soldiers with us. They got little carts and bikes and prams. I can remember when we did nothing but do peasants' feet. The feet got bad and our medic bound them up. Well, my feet were terrible. The soldiers kept putting me on their backs because I couldn't walk anymore. I was only a little kid. Oh, it was awful. Well, my, my father gave up. He, he didn't want it. He said, I'm not going any further. He said, the Bosch can have me. Deep in a complex of tunnels beneath Dover Castle, the British began to formulate Operation Dynamo. The person with the overall control of the evacuation was Admiral Bertram Ramsey, who was a trusted old naval hand and who was put in an extraordinarily difficult situation. He was working from Dover Castle, in fact working from the Dynamo. The message came through here that Operation Dynamo was to commence. Things would had to be done so quickly. You hadn't got weeks to plan what to do. It had to be done immediately. The recovery was no ordinary military operation. Admiral Ramsey devised an evacuation involving over 900 vessels. The port of Dunkirk had been almost completely destroyed uh, by the Luftwaffe. It was almost unusable. So all you had was the beaches. The trouble was, the ships were too large to come in close to the beaches. The beaches were, were very, very shallow. It was a flat, vast, dune beach, which is great if you want to sunbathe, but if you're trying to get large destroyers up to it and get men off the beach, it's, it's impossible, and that is what they found. What was needed were, were smaller boats that could actually ferry the soldiers from the beaches to the larger naval and civilian ships offshore. The British government appealed for small civilian craft to join the rescue mission. The operation would become the biggest evacuation in military history. Desperate times call for desperate measures. 
It came out by radio to begin with, and that was it. That's all people knew. It wasn't until very late on in the evacuation that the newspapers and the radio even reported that there was an evacuation. It was kept secret. It was all done in such a rush, the requirement to requisition the vessel sort of came overnight. It was organised chaos and everybody who could lend a hand, lent a hand. A lot of the time, the owners had no idea that their boats were being taken. If the owner happened to be nearby, then they could join in with the project. If not, the Navy basically went along and just took them. Arriving at the outskirts of Dunkirk, Many of the exhausted soldiers had not eaten for days. I drove 48 hours, kept falling asleep in the wheel, hitting the curb, waking up, and eventually arrived at the beach. I went into a cafe and asked if we could have some water in our bottles because we'd had no drink. And the lady said, I'm sorry, we've got no water in Dunkirk. The Germans have blown up the waterworks. She said, but I will fill it with Van Rouge for me. So we had Van Rouge for the beach. I said, look at that warehouse over there. Look, it's empty. There's nobody there. I said, give me your rifle. So I got a rifle. And I bang, bang, bang. That five shots with them. Open the door. And when I opened up this door, you would never believe this. It was full of neat Jamaica rum, loads of carnation milk, Biscuits, everything you wanted is going to be left for the Germans. Dunkirk was a military disaster. The loss of equipment to the British Army was colossal. As soon as they got to Dunkirk, the soldiers were surprised to hear that they were going to have to blow up their cars, their tanks, anything that they'd travelled in to get there. The vast majority of the equipment that the British Army had taken to France with them was lost. All their heavy artillery, virtually all their vehicles, all those had to be abandoned in France because they couldn't get them back across the channel. They were told to put sand into the tanks so that the engine would completely seize up because they didn't want the Germans to have any of their equipment. But as every soldier has drummed into him, they didn't leave their rifles behind. You put on a charge if you lose the rifle. That was more valuable to them than your life. <laughs> my 1500-weight van went into the canal with my kit bag, camera, with some films that would be worth a fortune now. We smashed up all the lorries and we couldn't take them to England. We took our machine guns out the lorry, drove the lorries over the machine guns so they were destroyed, then cut all the pipes on the lorries and left them running so they'd seize up. We just got to smash everything up, pour all the petrol into the water. Didn't like doing it. There was a big hotel on the seafront. We went down into the cellar. We dived in, you know, and, and we saw other people in there. And this woman, she said, don't, don't bother, she said, come in, she said. And there was beds there, and we laid there for a while, you know. It was, it was all right, but we couldn't go to the toilet or anything. But we had a machine gun on the top, where they were firing, keep the enemy away. but. It didn't seem to make any difference. You couldn't do anything with money. There was money lying in the street. You sir. After we got to the beach, the lieutenant said to me, you're Air Force and these are all Army and if they get hold of you, you'll get beaten up because they could see no support from the air. He said, well, what you'll have to do, take your shoes off and put some boots on, a Macintosh and a tin hat. So I was completely disguised as an Army chap. As tens of thousands of soldiers congregated on the sands at Dunkirk, they were confronted with scenes of destruction they would never forget. 
It was all on fire down the beach. We got attacked by the bombers. And the supers were coming down, dive bombing on the beach. People don't realise, but my God, you saw all your mates being blown to pieces, ships being blown apart. You had big cannons going off. We were powerless, we couldn't shelter. We just got out of the sun. I can remember being in the back of a big sunbank, and uh, I could hear bullets going into the other side of it. We just had to lay in the sand. It's all rather nasty. Fighters and bombers kept coming over, machine gun on the beach. No protection at all. And you just sat on the beach and nowhere to go. So you just sat there and hoped that they'd miss you. We used to make a duvet. We would dig up the sand, put a tin roof on it, and make a hole so you could crawl in. The part of the beach that I was on, there was no officers at all. We just I had to look after ourselves. I don't remember seeing an officer there. Everybody was just looking at us themselves. There's bodies lying all over the place. We had to bury a lot, and where we buried them, they put bottles. And I didn't know till, well, re recently, they put the bottles there to know where they were buried so that they could take them up again. Morale plummeted to a previously unknown level as the soldiers waited without supplies or hope. For about four days, I hadn't got any food, no water, nothing. 48 hours on the beach. No food, no water, nothing. And we couldn't drink the water, we couldn't drink nothing. Oh, it was terrible. There were people going out of their minds. Some just, I suppose, just gave up. I don't know. We had a cook about uh, 24 stone, and, and he found an old bicycle. And he was riding around the beach on his bicycle. The feeling of despair was in your mind all the time. You didn't know what was going to happen. You were just numb. You couldn't think ahead. Yeah, we did, you know, wonder what was going to happen. As they waited under a hail of bombs and machine gun fire, the defenseless soldiers felt abandoned by the Royal Air Force. There was a general sense of, uh, amongst the army on the beach that they had been abandoned by the RAF. There was enough defence. Where was the aircraft gun? There was none there. I've never saw one British plane. They didn't do much. Well, we hadn't got many planes, had we? The Royal Air Force and Fighter Command were being vilified by the soldiers and sailors who felt the RF weren't defending them at Dunkirk. Every time they looked up in the sky, they only saw Germans. Where were the RAF? We had one RAF Spitfire come across the beach, and everybody cheered. Plane. And this British plane came down with machine guns. It was a Spitfire that had been captured by the Germans, and the Germans were useless. Airmen who had been downed or who were working on the ground who were trying to get back on board ships to go back to Britain, they were basically turned away. Or they were attacked by people saying, you're not getting on board, you haven't helped us, off you go. That's how much they were vilified. I thought that was a bit uncalled for. We heard when we came back to England how the RAF were protecting the troops on the beach. Well, not on our beach. Weakened by losses during the French campaign, the RAF couldn't stop the German air assault, but they could hamper it. The soldiers and sailors simply believed that the RAF weren't there. The fact is, it was really unfair because the RAF were there. 
the air battles over Dunkirk were actually quite intense. They were there, they just weren't directly over the beach. But Spitfire overflying the beach is going at well over 300 miles an hour and he's going to be over the beach for a fraction of a second, a couple of seconds at most. The air-to-air -air combat that took place to try and stop the Germans from getting to the beach was seven miles inland. So would have been out of the line of sight of the, of the guys on the beach anyway. They were there. That's not over the beach, but a bit farther inland or out to sea. You had this extraordinary standoff. And of course, at the time of the Battle of Britain, the entire attitude to the RAF changed and they became the nation's heroes. As German divisions pressed in on the perimeter of Dunkirk, the BEF were on the verge of annihilation. Their fate balanced on a knife edge. I'll tell you something, when we were under all that fire on the beach, I don't think there were any atheists. I'd never stop praying. A lot of them might have changed their minds when they got off, but we used to have a saying, we used to dig these small trenches, which we call slit trenches, and they used to say there were no atheists in the slit trench. You know what I mean, when all this nasty stuff was coming up. So that's just my personal opinion. It was wonderful to see so many men praying. They've probably not prayed since, but I did a lot. We were in the cellar for a week, and they brought our baskets with the rosaries in, and we all had to have a rosary, and we all stood there and prayed. My mother was very courageous. She said, if we get through Dunkirk, we'll get through anything. And she was right. On the 27th of May, 1940, Senior Naval Officer Captain William Tennant arrived at Dunkirk to coordinate the evacuation. Tennant realised, OK, we don't have the port, but what we do have is this long breakwater, this long arm called the Mole. It was never intended for a ship to come alongside, never at all. It was just to stop the sand running into the harbour and silting it up. He immediately saw the prospect of tying ships up alongside this mole and using it as a quayside from which troops could then embark onto the vessels. What he did was to bring one ship alongside the mole to see, you know, will this work? And it did. An armada of ships crewed by the Royal Navy and civilian volunteers sailed through the treacherous waters of the channel. Many would face scenes they had never witnessed before. It was terrible. It was something I've never seen before. People was getting killed. These stupids coming down, boom, bang, boom, 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 all the time. It wasn't organised. To me, I can understand it's an emergency. You get over there, get what you can, push it back over. The majority of the little ships that came over were actually commandeered boats that were taken across by members of the Royal Navy. And these members of the Royal Navy very often didn't even know how the boats worked. A lot of them didn't know what they were doing. One boat had 60 people on it. When it came in, it was up here. When it was 60 people, the boat was right down, about two foot from the gunnel. The purpose of the little ships was to take people from the beaches onto the bigger ships offshore. So, you know, they might do this time and time and time again. I went in about nine o'clock and come out there about four. I was done about two trips, back and forward, picking up people. You get going out to see each other, you get in the boat. They're only filled up before we got to them. I didn't want to go back. I slept on the table. I can't go back to the game, but I was. Let's lay it in. We stood on that mole. We oh, we waited ages to get a ship. They were shooting at us. Oh, my God. We kept waving to ships, asking them to stop for us. A lot of them passed. Mummy had her nightie. She just kept waving, stopping the 
I'm British! The sailors came under merciless attack by the Luftwaffe. Ships were being destroyed, left, right and centre. So it was hell that you were going into. A third of the ships that took part were destroyed or put out of action. So it was a hugely dangerous undertaking. It was pandemonium, horrible. What I was doing was swimming about in the water, kicking up boats with no legs, no feet, and putting them on rafters and pushing them out to the boats. And it's oil, blood, I don't know what the green stuff was, it was green stuff, slimy green stuff. The dangers were many. For a start, you had to know where the minefields were. They were minefields that had been laid by Admiral Ramsey, but they were enormous. You could be run over by a boat that couldn't see you, or you could find that the sea was a fire, because when any of these large boats go down, the engines explode and the diesel ends up all over the surface. We could easily be shot. A lot of the people on the boats that came back dead had been shot by German aircraft, or they were being bombed out of the water. A lot of people didn't survive the crossing. As the first boats started coming in, they lifted the boom up and watched a boat come in, half of whom had, were dead. I come into Dover Harbour. And the blokes who were shooting us up, I had to tell them to stop firing, they're English. And there was four of us left out of 12. As the battle raged in land, across the sky, and into the sea, all hands worked to the absolute limits of their endurance. Nobody talked to each other. It was ow, ow, ow. I mean, it was in full uniform. I just waded out up to my neck in water because I saw this ship and it was a paddle steamer. I got hold of a rope, we pulled on board and that was the last thing I remember. I just passed out completely. When I come to, they'd carried me downstairs where the boilers were in my uniform, soaking wet, drying out by the boilers. We saw a coaster and it was on its side and it appeared to be on fire. There was all smoke coming from it, but we saw some people getting on it and so we went and explored. They were burning all the rags to make out it was on fire. So we got on the boat and this boat must have been used for taking coal. It was all coal dust. Every time a shell or bomb burst, all this coal dust came out. And dare I say, we were looking like the black and white minstrels. <laughs> Everybody was trying to get out somehow. And then the little ships came over, picked up a lot of people. Come on, you blokes, next stop, Dover. We were absolutely thrilled. And you were then praying, and praying, and praying to get back to Dover. We got to the mole and eventually we got to a fishing trawler called the Lord Grey and he counted us on and he said, that's enough now, off you go. So laid down and went to sleep straight away. We got on a boat full of Russians, got 10 rounds in pocket. And my coat was wet and the ammunition was wet, so I put my coat on top of the engine works, the hot bit in the ship, and uh, forgot it. So I went to sleep. When I woke up, we were halfway over the chapel. And the chap on the boat said, anybody got any ammunition? So well, that reminded me, my coat was on top of the heating stuff. And I said, Christ, we go off any minute. And I went in and fetched it out. It nearly burnt me. I stuck it out and gave it quick. mother had me said, she said, we're not going for the big ships because they were bombing them like Billy. So we got this little oil tank for the Sutton. We had the captain's cabin and we were told we could be bombed any minute. It was so dangerous to get through all this 
debris and everything. We had to go through the fire to get out. The bombers were coming down and the machine guns were being fired at us all through. Some got sunk, some got away. Bombing, 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 bombing. You cannot believe hell, at least you can be if you're in it. And with all the baloney in it, what people say about not being scared, you can't help being scared. And you then prayed and prayed and prayed to get back to Dover. What happened? We got back to Dover. It was wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. So good enough. Daylight. We were shattered. Absolutely shattered. But what, what a feeling it was to know we're back in England. <laughs> it's a little feeling. <laughs> I can only say it was a miracle and we're just happy to be alive. Our company was 107 strong and there was just 31 of us got that, over 107. The British Army, who had left the shores of France in the depths of despair, were welcomed home as conquering heroes. We just lost a battle, but these people in England were treating us like heroes. The thing that I can still say to this day, doesn't sound very much, I know, but it was amazing. As we came into Harwich, there were hundreds of women on the docks, and they'd all obviously been told, as soon as the ships start coming off, grab a soldier and look after him. Standing on the quayside with all these lovely ladies, and they all wanted to get hold of the wounded here of me. And I was in more trouble from these ladies from the WS and any bloody Germans. They were all trying to grab me. The medical officer said, you're still warm, you'll do it. <laughs> Some lady got hold of my arm, took me into a hangar, gave me some tea and sandwiches. My co-driver, he survived, and he was telling everybody that I saved his life. Well, I didn't really. I was driving the lorry, he was in the back drunk, and I got him to the beach and got him out before we destroyed the lorry. So in a way, I suppose you could say I saved him, but not really. <laughs> when we finally reassembled, I was surprised that how many of my battalions had managed to get back. It was a miracle we got out. The people were very good when we got to England. They helped us out, gave us clothes. We had nothing, we had to be stripped and fast and poor, fumigated, God knows what. Dunkirk to me was an epic of absolute bravery. I went through hell to get out of hell. I got back safe from town. <laughs> That's how I feel. <laughs> Operation Dynamo was the biggest military evacuation in history. The campaign narrowly avoided a surrender to Hitler and was a major turning point of World War II. But to the soldiers who returned in 1940, it represented failure. The British soldiers who were evacuated back saw themselves as a sort of battered remnants of a defeated army. They'd been part of a terrible defeat. They came home ashamed. Well, it's just an evacuation, wasn't it? We got on a boat and that was it. These were heroes because they'd survived and it meant that we had a future in Britain. What Dunkirk did was it enabled the British to stay in the war. It was a triumph in that they managed to get away far, far more people than they thought they would have. It was amazing, you know, how many they saved. They were only expected to achieve a maximum of 45,000 troops. They managed in the end to reach out and save over 338,000 men. The British Army had survived.
A mood of national euphoria captured the British public. The smoke of battle hangs over Dunkirk, that port just across the channel from which thousands of men of the BEF are coming home. The magnificent rearguard action carried out by the British and French armies in the north is only equaled by the splendid work of the Navy in covering their embarkation and bringing them home. The soldiers return aboard warships and vessels of all kinds. They've been fighting unceasingly for two weeks, and the whole world has marveled at their tremendous courage and unshaken discipline under brilliant leadership. And never in the whole history of her defeats and her victories has Britain been prouder of her fighting son. Wait, glad to be back, boys. Sure. Yeah. It would be a long road to eventual victory. World War II would continue for another five years. But the events at Dunkirk made the next step in that journey possible. A lot of guys went off on leave for a few days just to recover. And you were all given that three days. Station warrant officer came in and he said, I'm afraid chaps, the valley here is at six o'clock. But seeing that you were at Dunkirk, you can get up at half past seven or eight o'clock and have a breakfast and that's it. The men of the BEF have been enjoying some respite from danger after their heroic withdrawal from Flanders. Here in a rest camp, they dust themselves down, sort themselves out, and indulge in a little music. My pal and I, we were together all through the war. We both survived Dunkirk. But when we went out to the boat, we sort of somehow went a different direction. And I assumed that he'd either killed or taken a prisoner. And he thought the same about me. And next morning, I was walking up the street to get a breakfast, and walking down in the opposite direction was my pal Ginger. And he suddenly spotted me and came and put his arms around me like long lost lovers. And um, we both thought the other had perished. I mean, the escapes I had was absolutely amazing. Ginger and I were in there, cinema, and I can't remember what the film was called. But we were in there and um, got hit by a bomb and there was over 500 people killed in it. And him and I walked out just covered in dust. Operation Dynamo has been the subject of multiple films. The 2017 release of Christopher Nolan's Dunkirk focused the world's attention once again on the events that changed the course of World War II. I just think it's one of the great stories in, in human history. I am very excited to have some of the veterans who were actually there participating in the events. Uh, we screened the film for them and it was one of the most daunting things I faced as a filmmaker to stand in front of those people who were really there, who are now well into their 90s, um, and show them you know, our version of their story. We went to the first showing of Dunkirk. I was on the red carpet up there, Leicester Square, and they were coming along doing their carpet all week. <laughs> there were hundreds of people behind the barriers, brought up and they were tearing and tearing. It was astounding, yeah. It was a good film. The only people who realised what the Dunkirk spirit was were people who were there. And no one else can imagine what it was like. I thought it was very really good. There was a couple of little minor things that I could have faulted. But in general, it was, it was pretty accurate. I sat on my backside watching the baloney. <laughs> I thought it's going to be a load of American rubbish, and I was quite pleasantly surprised. I thought it was pretty accurate. It wasn't my war. How can you make what we went through? <laughs> you cannot do it. Prince Harry invited me to the palace. What a marvellous man that he is, but I was only the second oldest man there. That was a shame. <laughs> they treated us like heroes. You are heroes. Well, 
you were and you still are. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. I, hope, I hope someone gave you a lift up the hill. Right? This lady, she pushed me for a little while, then someone came up from the palace and he said to me, do you know who that was? I said, no. He said, that was Kate. Well, I didn't know it was because she was at the back of me. He was so charming, Prince Harry. He came round and chatted to us all. And uh, he was very, very nice. I couldn't get my shoes on because my feet swelled, and uh, I had to go in my slippers. I said to Prince Harry, I apologise for having my slippers on. He said, at least the royal blue. <laughs> Prince Harry, thank you very much indeed. I would say we were heroes, and I thank God that I was.